A very warm greetings to all present. Uh, on behalf of NQCM, I, Dr. Sonam, welcome you all for today's training workshop for peer reviews and authors by Dr. Helen Krebs, uh, editor in chief for BMG Open Quality. So, without a further ado, I would I would like to welcome Dr. Vikram Datta to introduce our guest speaker for today. So Dr. Vikram Datta is the Director Professor at Department of Nanotology at ABVMS and Dr. Aramil Hospital, New Delhi. He is the President at Nationwide Quality of Care Network and a guest editor for, of PMJ Open Quality, South Asia edition. He is a member for Editorial Board International Journal for Quality in Healthcare Communications and a former Vice President for National Nanotology Forum in India. He's an expert at the International Society for the Quality in Healthcare and a lead for National mentoring group and technical resource group lead for the sustainable model for luxury ministry of health and family welfare he's also a mem uh, member of qd working group for ministry of health and uh, family welfare india i uh, welcome you sir over to you thank you so much uh, dr sonam a very warm welcome to dr helen chris editor-in-chief bmj open quality uh, joining us live from the united kingdom good morning to you ma'am and thank you so much for agreeing to our request uh, to conduct a session for the authors and the peer reviewers who are planning to submit articles in the coveted journal that is the BMG Open Quality. I would just like to uh, express my deep gratitude and especially on behalf of NQCN, WHO, UNICEF India and the entire Southeast Asia region to Helen Chris and the entire team at BMJ UK for reposing their faith in the NQC in India and allowing us to partner with them and to bring a special edition, which is the third in the series now going. Last two years have been phenomenal issues where we've seen nearly 40 original research papers which have been published in quality improvement from the subcontinent. And it is at uh, the insistence of the peer reviewers and great amount of time and energy which the peer reviewers have devoted that these editions have seen the light of the day in the time. Now, Ellen Chris needs no introduction to the NQCN family, but I would just like to mention again formally that she is also working besides the editor-in-chief of BMJ Open Quality as an independent consultant at Chris QI. Previously, she's been the assistant director of research at Health Foundation. And she's been the Director of Accreditation Services and Consultancy Services at CHKS Accreditation Unit, London, UK. Her areas of expertise range from patient safety, person-centered care, quality improvement methods, and healthcare improvement research. I'm sure the session with Helen is going to be very interactive today. And any question and answers which are there may kindly be posted in the Q&A box or in the chat box mentioning your name. At the end of the session and the formal presentation by Helen, we are going to take question and answers, which Helen will directly be answering, will be coordinated by us. So over to you, Helen, the floor is all yours. And a warm welcome to all the participants. It's a working day in India right now, and we all made this of the hospital duties. So I, uh, I'm also uh, seeking permission from Helen to release the recording on the NQC and YouTube page for the benefit of the larger audience subsequently. Thank you so much. Over to you, Helen. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'll just get my slides up. Yep, there we go. So delighted to have this opportunity to work with you on this session. <clears throat> um, and so very pleased um, that there's a lot of people joining this or who will be able to <clears throat> view the recording afterwards. <clears throat> so um, what we're going to do today is just give an overview of the journal and um, the editorial process. Think a little bit about the role of peer review how to use the online platform when undertaking a peer review, and most importantly, how to ensure that when you do a peer review that you're providing constructive and useful comments that are really going to help the authors of the paper that you peer review to understand how it needs to be improved and what they need to do to get that paper ready for publication if, if as a peer reviewer, you think that it should proceed to publication. 
So to start off with an overview of the journal BMJ Open Quality, um, which is publishing the, the South Asia Special Supplements, um, focusing on quality improvement in the region. Um, so as the name suggests, it's focused on quality improvement in healthcare. Um, it's a, a second tier journal. We're looking to, to publish papers and encourage um, the sharing of quality improvement uh, experience rather than looking for um, sort of uh, really innovative groundbreaking research. So it means we have a higher acceptance rate than many journals. It's fully open access, which means that anybody can go on the website and read the papers. You don't have to have a subscription or pay any sort of paywall monies to, to access the articles. They're all available to view. Uh, it is online only. There's, there's no published paper-based version available, um, and it is PubMed indexed. The journal publishes a range of paper types. Um, the quality improvement report is the one that really is what we'd call the bread and butter of, you know, it's really at the heart of the journal. But we do also publish original research around quality improvement, um, around um, we publish systematic reviews focused on quality improvement, narrative reviews. Um, I'd be very interested to get more papers which are about research and reporting methodology for quality improvement. We publish short reports, which need to be um, nuggets of information. I mean, don't please don't put in a truncated quality improvement report reporting on a whole intervention. A short report should be about some facet of quality improvement um, that, that can be very succinctly explained. And quality education reports, which is where this is a report of education on quality improvement, not about the quality of general professional education, but about education in quality improvement. So our publishing niche is, as I've said, the publication of QI reports, and we want those to be well-written, useful QI reports. The point of publishing these is that other people can read them, learn from them, and see whether they could apply what's been done in their own setting. All of the papers are peer reviewed, uh, which is very important. It leads to its credibility. This isn't, um, uh, you know, this isn't sort of vanity publishing. This isn't the sort of journal that's just looking to get the fees for publishing. It, it's looking for quality of work to be published. The open access model does have to be funded. So if people aren't paying to read the papers, it needs to be funded in another way. And this is through the article publishing charges, which are paid by the authors. I mean, usually the authors institutions um, or through grants. If, if the work's been funded through a grant, sometimes the, the, the funder will pay the, the APC, the article publishing publishing charges. But that is how, that is the how this model of publishing is funded. We publish on average 15 to 25 papers per month and also, and that's in addition to any special supplements. Currently, the South Asia supplement is our main supplement. When people uh, put in a QI report, we ask them to use to use the Squire guidelines, the standards for quality improvement reporting excellence, which have been developed by leading uh, practitioners and researchers in quality improvement in healthcare, and those have been adapted to, into a pro forma. So we really do want to see that quality improvement reports come into the journal in this format. Um, and to find out more, you can um, go on to just Google. Squire guidelines and it will take you straight to the home page um, and to tell you a bit more about this framework for reporting knowledge about how to improve healthcare. Um, and really at its heart, Squire guidelines are based around four fundamental questions, which are really what we want to know in any QI report. Why did you start? What, what was the issue that made you think that this was something that needed to be tackled through quality improvement? What did you do? A very simple question, but that that really needs to be very, very well explained. So it's absolutely clear what were the stages of planning the work, how it was tweaked as you went along, how it was implemented, what challenges came up when you tried to implement the work. So what did you do is, is really at the heart of these reports. What did you find is reporting the results? Um, and what does it mean? making sure that there's not overinterpretation of the results um, and that there's a, a real um, 
a thorough review of, of what have we learned, have what we, what have we learned from doing this work? What is the significance? What are the takeaway points? And very importantly, what are the limitations? A lot of quality improvement projects are fairly small in scale. Um, they may have run into organizational difficulties and you need to very, very carefully think about what are the limitations? You know, how easy would it be for somebody else to reproduce what you've done or how difficult? Um, and so we, we ask people to, to really focus on the introduction, the problem definition, what's currently known about this, um, why did you focus on this uh, particular area or issue? What did you do? What is your context? What is your What sort of health uh, facility are you working in? What sort of um, population are you serving? What was the intervention? Very, very clear um, explanation of the intervention, what you did differently, the study of that and the measures that you used, the analysis and ethical considerations of how you involved patients and staff. What did you find? How did this work evolve and modify as you went along? Um, reporting on your data for both process measures and outcome measures, being very clear about missing data and were there any unintended consequences. And then this discussion around what does it mean, your interpretation, the limitations of the work and your conclusions. So these are the four key sections of a quality improvement report. Now to go into a little bit about the editorial process, what happens you know, once you click the button and you submit your paper. <clears throat> um, all, the papers, all the papers are submitted online through an online portal. They, they all go into a big sort of sorting house behind the scenes uh, online, which BMJ manages. Papers, obviously you have selected the journal BMJ Open Quality at submission and all of those papers come to me for editorial review. And I do an immediate scan and decide, does, does this, my main thought at this point is, does this paper fit our remit for publishing quality improvement reports? We, we get some uh, papers submitted, which are um, clinical interventions, which don't fit for quality improvement. We get audit reports submitted, um, unless it's gone on to the next stage of doing some quality improvement in response to the audit, we don't publish audit reports. So those are my first two thoughts. And then my next uh, my next questions are, do I understand what this is about? Do I understand what this group have done through quickly reading the paper? Um, and if I if at that stage I can't understand it, it doesn't seem to make any sense to me. <clears throat> I reject it because it seems if I if I can't understand really just basically what it's about, um, it's going to require far too much work to turn it into a publishable paper. So it, it sort of needs to go, rather than encouraging people to keep reworking and reworking something that sort of hasn't got the basics there, we reject at that stage. Now, most other, now all other papers then go to peer review. I have just had a quick scan really of thinking, is it in or is it out? And, and my, my uh, criteria for rejecting are sort of quite sort of basic and, and most, most suitable papers will, will overcome that and be sent to peer review. <clears throat> so the peer reviewers then need to read the papers very carefully, um, provide a full commentary and um, uh, a set of comments and uh, really think about what's the content of the paper, how easily has it been to understand, how could this paper be improved and, and write notes and have a come to a conclusion about the paper as to whether um, it can be accepted without any further revision. I have to say very, almost no papers come into that category. Nearly everything does require some, at least some minor revision. They have to make a view as to whether they think it's a minor revision or a major revision, or at this point, the peer reviewers can reject because they will be taking a much more careful, detailed and considered read of the paper than I have done. So peer reviewers may feel that um, the methodology is not robust when you look into it in more detail, that the results are not clear or the, answer, the, the results don't seem to relate to what was done. Um, or that the conclusions are very much overstated. So for various reasons, the peer reviewers may decide that actually the paper is a reject, that it doesn't meet the criteria for um, a suitable paper for publication. But the majority of papers 
come back as minor revision or major revision. And then they are sent back out to the authors um, to come back with a revised version. And then they come back and they are then peer reviewed again. We very much want to use the same peer reviewers to review the papers again so that you can see how it has changed from the original version. How have they taken your comments on board? Um, so we, we try to stick with the same um, reviewers. So that very simply is, is how it works. I mean, it looks deceptive, deceptively simple. I mean, this can take quite a number of weeks um, when you sort of think about the sort of people who are involved, people needing to do work at every stage, all of us are busy, nobody works full time on this. Um, you know, everybody's really doing it in their spare time. So there are some inevitable delays um, in going around that cycle. So just to sort of summarize re reasons for rejection, um, if it's not focused on quality improvements and application of, of methods, we, we don't accept it. Other reasons would be if it's very focused on some very tiny specific aspect of clinical delivery in one specialty, it's not really for a general journal like um, BMJ Open Quality. It needs to be published in a, um, a specialty specific journal. It may be something that's really not, we don't deem it sufficiently important to patients or practitioners. We get some papers which are very much about improving some really quite small aspect of how how professionals do their work and whilst that that does have importance but if it if you can't really see how it translates to improve patient care we may decide to reject that if it's incoherent or not based on supplier guidelines we'll certainly ask people to reformat and re rewrite it before rather than peer reviewing in its current form if most most uh, obvious place where papers lack is the narrative about the implementation. People really tend to rush onto their results, focus on the data and not tell us about the process of doing the improvement. Um, but equally, we do have incomplete or inappropriate statistics reported and that if they don't seem to add up, um, then we would re reject the paper. If we think it's unlikely to have really any impact, we may decide it's not really worth going through all the effort of polishing it up and going to publication. And if there's over-interpretation results and people are really over-claiming the significance of their work, we will tend to reject it. So the role of peer reviewers is to critically appraise a paper, and this is based on experience in the field and then applying that to what you think is the likely value of this paper to the field. It's really important to be objective on the merits and defects of the paper and not be too personal about sort of how you would have done the study or what you would like to see. You have to remember it's the author's paper and you're viewing what they've put in front of you, not what you would have done. It's the, the, the aim, rather than telling people what's wrong with their paper, is actually to provide useful comments to help improve the paper. And sometimes if we only say what's wrong, the authors are just left very confused, not knowing how do they make it better? What is it? What, what would make this better? Why, why has the reader struggled with this part of it what what do I need to do and you need to provide that information what to do to improve the paper um, or if you feel it really isn't suitable to to very clearly express why this paper is not suitable for publication um, but in a in a kind and professional way not rubbishing their work and the peer review is absolutely essential to help the editors in their publishing decisions. Um, this is, you know, the, the interactions between the editor, the peer reviewers and the authors is the absolute engine of the journals. And really the peer reviewers are very much doing the bulk of this work because it is the peer reviewers who read between them, read every paper in great detail, forensically, go through it step by step. Um, and that is what enables um, us to make decisions about what papers to publish. It's also the rate limiting factor um, of getting papers through to publication um, is that we, we do struggle to find enough peer reviewers and for people to do this in a timely fashion. So this is where it's the peer review stage at which papers are mostly held up. 
Um, in BMJ publications, Scholar One, the online platform, is where it all happens. So it starts off with you receiving an in very bland, rather boring looking email asking you to in, uh, review the paper and you click um, on the links below to accept the invitation to review. Then you're asked to confirm your response. If you haven't already reviewed and you don't have an account, you then need to set up an account. I mean, this is very quick and simple. There's nothing unexpected here. It seems to work quite well. I um, haven't, haven't had glitches reported in setting up an account. It works quite quickly. And then you log into your account to access the paper. So assuming that you have been uh, asked to review a quality improvement report, let's have a look at quality improvement reports. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that there is a huge reporting bias is because people feel it's worth writing up and they're motivated to make the effort because it is a lot of work to write a paper. And people like to do this when they feel their improvement work has been successful. Please remember that there is an awful lot that can be learned from um, interventions, um, quality improvement projects, which haven't achieved the results they were hoping for. So um, I would urge people, if you've done, if you're involved in a quality improvement program and it, it's not as successful as you would like, but you feel that you've got good data and you can analyze and explain the reasons behind that, please do think about publishing that because that will provide so much learning for other people. And equally, as a peer reviewer, if you're assigned a paper and you read it through and you say, oh, well, they didn't achieve their aim, do not assume that that means it shouldn't be published. If there has been a clear explanation of, of why they didn't achieve the aim and analysis of that and discussion of limitations, that will be a very useful paper. As I said, when writing up, people do tend to overfocus on results, um, you know, really sort of looking at the sort of percentages, you know, producing lots of tables, lots of data. But in order to understand that, we have to understand, you know, how how was the work, how were the work processes planned, what was adapted in terms of what people were actually doing that achieved this 14% reduction of X. So the, the methods and the experience of implementation are. I would say they're actually more important than the results. We need the results to sort of verify that, but without the information on methods and the experience of implementation, the results are, are meaningless um, and they don't, we can't really learn very much from them. So we do tend to have things, reports coming in that lack important details about key components of the intervention and sort of where it was carried out. So readers don't really know is, is this something I could do? Would this work where I work? Um, and we really do need to know about the barriers um, and how they were overcome, uh, what was changed as you went along. Very unlikely that you decide on a quality improvement intervention, plan it, implement it, all goes according to plan. Reporting like that actually decreases credibility for anybody who knows anything about health services um, and, and people learn more from understanding how challenges were overcome. We really need to know, a, you know, a, a full description of the methods. Um, PDSAs need to be plan, do, study, act. We need to know what, what was the content of each of those steps. So just to say we carried out three PDSA cycles is not informative. We need to know what, what, what was the focus of that? How was it planned? What were the measures? What did you do in response? to what you measured. So um, just briefly stating things is, is not helpful. Um, so we need to know um, a lot more about um, how the methods were used. Um, and particularly if you are doing Plan, Do, Study, Act, this, this key um, relationship between what was studied, what you learned from the per first PDSA, and therefore how you changed what you were doing in response to what you learn. So this is a very simple example for the illustration on, on the slide. So people doing a training intervention um, and reviewing the delivery mechanism using PDSA, what was reported, that the timing of the training session wasn't helpful um, and it needed to be planned with the ward managers. And what we learned from feedback, people wanted more visual material. So including all these details is really 
uh, important because it helps other people to understand um, what was done and what sort of mistakes um, and issues they may face if they do something similar. Now, in clinical uh, research, we get a lot of um, reporting of p-values, um, but most improvement projects don't yield very reliable data, and they're not really suitable for p-value reporting. They're unlikely to be underpowered with this sort of robust statistical analysis. Um, and equally, even if we have something which gives this result of statistical non-significance, this is not the same as having no effect. Um, and there's been quite a lot of writing about this, about really the overuse and over-reliance on p-values as the only valid uh, measure. And I'd say just be very, very cautious around this in relation to quality improvement work. So on to the real sort of meat of what we're here to talk about. Um, how do you do a peer review? How best to do a peer review? Well, obviously, first read the paper. And as you read it through, make a few notes. This the sort of impressions that you're getting. Is it clear? You know, what, what was this quality intervention? Has, do, you, do you think there's some stage, stages and steps have been missed out because you can't quite understand what the group did? Um, if you were to go into your department tomorrow and say, you know, I've read this great quality improvement method and I think we should uh, we should try and do something similar. Is there enough detail that you'd actually know how to do that? Do the results make sense in terms of what it is reported that was done and are the conclusions justified? So that's your first read through. What are your what are your impressions of these sort of vital aspects of the paper? Second, read the paper again and go into a bit more depth and look at the abst abstract, reread the abstract once you've now read the paper a couple of times and think, hang on, does this, does this really reflect what this is about? Sometimes abstracts are written very hurriedly um, and they haven't captured all the detail. Sometimes they're written first and then the paper is written and actually the final paper doesn't really reflect the original abstract. So check, check on that. Have the SQUIRE guidelines been used? Does it follow that logical progression? Think about what additional detail or explanation you would like to see. What are those missing bits that you're going, hang on a minute, I don't understand how you got from here to here. Who did what? You know, we, we, made, we made modifications to the electronic patient record. Well, you know, how did you do that? Who had to be involved in order to get those amendments made you know you don't you just go into the system do it yourself you need to negotiate that with an IT team somebody needs to sign that off what was the process of that we need that sort of detail are the methods clear what additional information do you want and how could results be more clearly presented we often have graphs often have quite a lot of graphs and then you're looking at them going I don't I don't understand what this is supposed to show. I don't understand how table three differs from table five. They seem to be showing the same things. So really, you just take this critical eye and look at it all in more depth. So for the overview, contents and context, is it clear what the focus of the QI intervention was? You know, why did they decide to tackle this particular issue? Is the clinical setting clearly explained? Do you think that the content will be likely to interest to other readers you know is it is it generalizable is this something that other people in that sort of similar or even other settings are likely to learn from or is it so niche so individualized that you know really it's of no validity to other people things to look out for in language and presentation uh, overuse of acronyms is absolutely rife people love an acronym they think it makes it more succinct. They think it makes it easier to understand. It does not. Every acronym is a sort of a blip in your reading of the sentence. It sort of stops your eyes. And then you have to think, oh, now what did this mean in this context? They're only to be used for the most frequent terms in the paper. They have to be spelt out on first use and really sort of think about where people could cut them down. Similarly, jargon. I mean, we'd ask people not to use it, um, particularly where its health is specific to a particular specialty or a particular health service. In the UK, you know, it's absolutely awful. You know, often when we get papers that are based in the NHS in the UK, they are full of NHS jargon and people don't understand that that is not understandable to an international audience. And also, I really don't like to see the use of Latin terms. 
Um, I know a lot of medical um, teaching still uses these, but I don't think they have a I don't think they have a place in a generalist journal where many people reading the journal won't understand them, have not had that training, and would really prefer to see those in English. And it, the, the aim is that the the language shouldn't be arcane, it shouldn't be pompous, or it, or it shouldn't be too technical. It should be written so that any um, any general lay reader could understand um, the project and what was done. Regard to methods and implementation, we are looking for a clear QI method. Now, one of the things we've fallen into a bit of a trap in people thinking that unless the group have used the model for improvement and used PDSA cycles, it's not quality improvement. Now, that is not true. There are many other approaches to quality improvements. People can do a phased project. It doesn't have to have PDSA, particularly if people are implementing something that is already well tried and tested. PDSA may not be appropriate because you're not actually wanting to test the method, you're wanting to have a plan for how it would be implemented. Um, and that can be a clear QI method. But we do want to see a cohesive step-by-step -step account of the implementation. And we want to be clear that the measures and data that they're clearly expressed, that we understand where that data came from, that we understand what the baseline measure was, and that the measures clearly relate to the process or um, intervention that the quality improvement was, was focused on. It's no good looking at um, length of stay measure if the intervention method was nothing to do with that um, and wasn't likely to have a, an impact on length of stay, for example. In the discussion limitations and conclusion, we need to ensure that they are in line with the results reported. There is, people get a bit, I don't think they're really meaning to um, sort of lie to us, but they get very enthusiastic about their results and then tend to overclaim. Um, and none of this work happens in a vacuum. There's always lots of other things going on. We, and in many situations, we can't we can't be entirely sure that the quality intervention was totally responsible for the improvement um, that was observed. There needs to be a sort of a good case for that. Um, but also it's, it's, it's sort of it's useful if the authors can also include information about what else was going on, what else may have had an effect, and have they fully explored the limitations of their work? I mean, this is often things like small sample size, limited time, um, limited in not having all the expertise they needed on on their team, for example. So they need they need to really sort of think about that, you know, or they had an extra they had an extra research student doing this and some grant money and then they need to think about but if we don't have those will this be sustainable for the long term so have they considered that limitation and as I said you know we, we don't we want to sort of check on overclaiming of significance of what was done so I would say once you've done all of that then please start actually completing the review on the on the um, online platform um, you need to state that you don't have um, competing interest um, and say most of these studies don't require research ethics but we do require people to say to formally state that it didn't require research ethics to complete. Um, for quality improvement reports there's a series of questions and boxes um, it's a fault of the system these boxes do not get sort of pulled through into the, the peer review report um, that goes to the author. So these are useful for the notes and to explain your thinking, but anything you write here doesn't automatically get pulled through to the, to the comments of the author. This is where, and it's quite a small box, but this is where you need to make your comments, which will go through to the author in the comments to author box. And then, and you make uh, your recommendation as to whether it's accept minor revision, major revision, or reject on the form. But yes, please remember that comments to author is the really crucial part of the form online. So we're wanting you to be objective on the merits and defects of the paper, to provide useful comments to help improve the paper, or as I said, or kindly and professionally explain why it's not suitable to progress to publication. And I'd say, please be as thorough as possible when you first review the paper. What we're finding is that we have a review and it goes back to the authors and then the first revision paper comes back. 
And then it's re-reviewed. And then the peer reviewers are finding lots of other things that they want the authors to do. And I, I just think that's not really fair. I think it's really, you've got to do a very thorough job in the first instance. And then you're checking whether the authors have responded appropriately to the peer review uh, comments that you have made. I mean, if you if you do see something that you think, oh, gosh, I didn't mention that and it's really important, then yes, you have to put it in. But please don't go looking for other things to find. When you're presenting your peer review comments in that box, it's very helpful if you can divide it into major and minor comments. So major comments are things like this sort of lack of clarity on the intervention, being clear about what you want them to include, no detail on the stages of the PDSA cycles, poorly presented results that you found it difficult to understand, and inconsistency uh, of the results with the aim of the project. Please focus on these sorts of major comments and go on to minor comments if you have time. This is where if you have got time to go through and, and note Things like the grammatical errors, the spelling errors, any typos such as missed word and acronyms not spelt out at first use. I mean, for these to be useful, you need to sort of state where they are and sort of either say generally and give a couple of examples, but be clear that you're only giving a couple of examples and the authors need to go through and check for all the rest. Or, you know, if you are able to and have the time to do a really thorough job, it's it's really brilliant when people can go through line by line and say where the errors are and, and what they are. But that is time consuming and would much rather you spend if you limited time spend it on the major comments rather than the line by line analysis. So um peer review comments, what is useful? Um can you please elaborate on why failure to write max, max daily PRN dose error was chosen? So they're saying like, we don't understand, this seems quite a, a minor thing. Um, you know, Explain your rationale. And it's clarity about where this is in the manuscript and why you're asking it. Was this improvement mainly focused on prescribing rather than medication errors as a whole? A precise question, you're asking for clarification and, you know, and pointing out that the paper is not clear about this. Um, the paper mentions a range of errors with impact on patients. It would be useful to include examples of specific errors and the severity of impact of these errors. So we're saying that you, you've talked about this in a general way, but some extra information would be helpful here and really would bring the paper alive for the readers. So this is the sort of thing that we're looking for. We do tend to get quite a lot of cryptic notes. Authors need to rewrite the aim. That, that may very well be true, but the author was given no clue as to sort of what aspect of their aim needs clarification or, or why does it need to be redone. Presentation of data was not how I would have shown it. Well, that's very um, subjective and doesn't say how specifically the presentation could be made clearer. It would have been better if the project had focused on reasons for test requests rather than delay of tests. And this sort of comment is actually quite irrelevant because you're sort of looking the peer reviewer is looking at it from the context of what they believe is important what's you know their own experience well that's not the author's experience and they're not really commenting on the quality improvement project that was done they kind of want to see a different quality improvement done, project done um and you need to focus on you know what the people have done what's in front of you so as we said if we paper goes back with your notes um, and the authors are asked to provide a revised paper and then it will be resent to you as a reviewer when the revisions are made. So the point then is to check have they responded to the peer review comments appropriately and really read through the revised paper to see has it be, is it improved, is it clearer and only pick up additional points where it's crucial and as I said please don't, don't go looking for more and more things to comment upon. Um, we, we'd really like sort of revision three to be the final point of a paper. And we've got things currently going to revision five, revision six. And it's just sort of spinning it out. And I, I think, you know, either the paper is OK to be published or, you know, it, you know, maybe it should have been rejected a lot earlier. But but please don't, don't you know, there has to be a point at which, yes, it's good enough. It may not be perfect, but it's good enough. And don't keep looking for more and more um, little points of detail that you think um, could be changed. 
So that's it for my presentation. And we're now able to go into Q&A. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Helen, we have uh, to congratulate you for that very crisp presentation. And I think uh, it made a lot of sense because uh, I think the main issue which we are uh, facing as peer reviewers is the multiplicity of uh, the reviews into which the papers are going. And often, I think uh, uh, a couple of issues uh, we are into the South Asia edition. We have noticed that uh, often uh, additional points come up. So your mm -hmm. emphasis on conducting a very exhaustive and very accurate, uh, meaningful and very clear peer review with the comments which are more uh, you know, supportive to the authors rather than being critical of the hard work which they have done. I think that is something which is very, very important. So my uh, request to all the peer reviewers and prospective authors is that we should focus more on the methodology like uh, Helen mentioned for the authors. And for the peer reviewers, the first peer review needs to be absolutely clear and it needs to be more in as a way to improve the paper rather than to be critical and to be ambiguous. So with this, uh, I think I will quickly take the question. So I will take the question strictly in the order in which they appeared. So first question is from Dr. Kedar. So the uh, Dr. Kedar says, what should be the eligibility for beer, becoming a peer reviewer? Yeah, Helen, over to you. Um, I think, I mean, peer, for peer reviewers for um, open quality, we are seeking people who have been involved in quality improvement in their own setting and have some experience of using these methods to improve processes, processes of care and to focus on um, patient safety. So um, that, that's, that is the qualification, is that you are a practitioner in quality improvement in healthcare. Okay, so I think that pretty well answers Kedar's question. There are a couple of more questions. I'll quickly come to them. Uh, he additionally asks uh, criteria for acceptance of an article by reviewer, especially considering the documentation of sustainability. Kedar has been regularly reviewing the papers for BMJ and in a very uh, nice manner. As editor for South Asia, I compliment him for that. And he's been very worried about, uh, you know, the sustainability part. Like mm. the duration of sustainability in most of the reports which are coming from India for BMJ are, uh, it's not a very long period, I would say, or rather not a very, you know, even uh, not running often into a quarter sometimes mm. for some mm. of the reports. So we would like to know that uh, does sustainability become one of the you know major points on which we decide whether to accept or to reject the paper? Um, it, it is in fact it is an important consideration. Was I think we can't we can't accept or reject on whether the improvement has been shown to sustain. What we need what we need is for the authors to have fully considered that. And I think that that is often a comment that goes back, you know, there's nothing about how this is going to carry on beyond the original project. I think if the authors then are not able to come back with anything sort of sensible about how, and they may say, well, we, you know, yes, that's going to be a problem. Or we know we won't have this extra time. I think that's fine because that shows it's been considered and there is still some learning there that you can put in these resources and and help and and, and make a change, um, but that they've learned that this unfortunately their change won't sustain. I I think if we didn't publish them unless they had proof of sustainability, I think we'd be publishing very little. But we do need the authors to show that they've considered that. Um, and I think if if after it's got gone for revision, they still haven't said anything about sustainability, we might reject at that point. Vidar, I think you can go ahead with your third question and yeah. also, yeah. The question regarding sustainability, sometimes uh, the report mentioned that we have sustained it for so and so period, but the, the, there is no explanation regarding how they have uh, incorporated the sustainability, how they are going ahead with the sustainability, especially the uh, interventions and the measures uh, for that. Another thing is some reports uh, take say around, for example, six months for a project period for improvement. And then sustainability is documented not even for that much period, say, for the six months. Mm. 
So, mm. and then there are many reports uh, without SPC charts uh, documenting system. There are only run charts available most of the time. Mm. So, what is your view on this? Yeah, we'd like we'd like to see SPC charts, but I think it's not. I don't think we're at a stage where we can expect that every quality improvement team will be able to produce those. Um, so it, you know, if, if they haven't really, if they haven't recorded the data, you know, at a level where they can really produce a, a full SPC chart, I think we have to accept to run chart. Um, but again, it should be, it should be stated as a limitation. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I think Helen, what we can see here is most of the questions in the Q and A are related to. We've got a question from Avinash and also from Professor Manjupuri. They're both related to uh, sustainability. Professor Manjupuri uh, uh, wants to know that is there any particular minimum time period of sustainability to ensure before we decide to submit the paper? Um, and I'd, I'd say I'd say no. But I think it would be. Um... I think you know we, we would be we would we would have to sort of be very cautious about something that had only been only had a very short you know a, a say a three month implementation period, um, but I think it's it's more about it's more about ensuring that it, it's recognised as a limitation. Um, you know, we I think I think the advice people could be that we would like to see reports where the project has been completed and there's at least you know there is at least six months data post the you know post the actual sort of project stage but that would be a sort of a guideline rather than a requirement and where it where it's shorter than that it, we, we should we should really be pushing on that in in review comments and, and and ensuring that that is something that the authors have addressed um in in terms of their thinking about that So I think uh, uh, that clearly answers uh, that it is desirable to have a paper with a good sustainability at least three to six months, but that does not uh, mandatory. And as Helen was saying, we are not looking at any publication bias that we only publish QI interventions which are successful and well sustained. So we need to understand that often the interventions are carried out and they may not be sustained. And sometimes uh, the interventions are carried out, they are sustained. And sometimes interventions are meeting a lot of challenges, they just can't pick up. So these are some of the things which we uh, need to understand at this point of time. Now, uh, there's another question from Dr. Khidar. He says, few reports mentioned mainly training interventions and no system of process level changes. How do we go about reviewing those and what should be our decision as an editorial team on that? Mm. Yeah. So just training intervention because most of the early teams go on training or counseling, Helen, and they feel that mm. uh, doing it uh, in a much harder way is quality improvement. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's true. I mean, I think in terms of training interventions, we need the author, we need the authors to show some awareness of awareness of the literature, which shows that um, education interventions, when it's not supported by process change or or other other aspects of um, in way what we call sort of work as done, are unlikely to be sustainable and unlikely to achieve change. Now, uh, you know, clearly, education does have a does have a, a place and people do need to be trained in new ways of doing things. So again, we're looking for understand so some references to the literature or people understanding that this is um seen as sort of kind of kind of quite a weak intervention. And you know, what's their experience been around that? Would they would they agree that it's, you know, they've seen the limits of the education, of the educational input? And I think that would make a very interesting paper. People said, you know, we, you know, we we decided to do this education of nursing staff. We've read the le read the literature and um, tried to make sure that our training and educational in intervention was as robust as possible. However, we still came up against these limitations. That's a very interesting paper. You know, it doesn't doesn't sort of negate it. Um, and there may be, and you know, we, you know, we we need to keep it in an open mind because there may be particular types of education on particular issues and particular contexts where it you know it bucks the trend of the literature and people can say well no actually this was very successful and our educational intervention did bring about change and it's still happening um 
10 months after we did our last training session. So I think, again, it's sort of keeping an open mind about this, um, but we're certainly looking for some awareness of why did people think, why did people think that purely providing some instruction and education would achieve change and how have they measured whether or not it did achieve change? I think very important message which Helen has given for the benefit of the uh, participants is that whenever we are using an educational intervention, it's very, very important to have a baseline and uh, objectively to quantify if you have some scoring system, the increase in knowledge or you objectively quantify how the practices have improved. And you have some scoring or some objectivity bring out, brought out into it. Otherwise, we would just mentioned and most of them say i was recently reviewing a paper where they just mentioned that uh, training sessions were then and that led to an improvement in uh, you know a particular outcome of interest so not uh, not a mention about how training sessions were changed how many training sessions were done what was the baseline knowledge level what was the feedback uh, scores which were obtained from the participant, et cetera. So some sort of objectivity, even in educational interventions. Yeah, Kedar, very quickly, before I go to the last question from Abhishek, we just have four minutes to this session. When, when, a, when an article is again presented for re-reviewing it after correction by the author, are we supposed to uh, again write the same previous finding as well as the fresh findings from the repeat review or only fresh findings? Um, I think it's good to it's good to acknowledge where the change, but not not necessarily point by point. If if you feel that some of your previous points haven't been taken on board, I think they should be restated. But equally, we have to accept that it's the author's paper, not our paper as peer reviewer. I mean, some I think if the authors have explained why they haven't taken your comment on board, I think that's fair enough. But if they've just ignored it, I think it should be restated. Um, and as I say, really, I'd say don't don't go really looking for more things to say about the paper. If something else strikes you thinking, oh, gosh, I sort of now I look at this again. I I, I, mi I missed the fact that, um, you know, so for example, they they their evaluation of the education session wasn't very good. You know, I, I think that's worth I think something material it's worth bringing in if it, if it sort of strikes you on reading the paper. But as I say, I think it's in some ways it just seems a bit unfair to keep looking for more and more points um, to bring up if, if we didn't cover it in our first review. I mean, it's like all of these things. It's a balance. You don't want something to go through which now, you know, you think has sort of got a sort of glaring area of defect in it. Um, but it's also about being a little bit about, oh, yeah, that could have been a bit better, but you know, I won't raise it at this stage. If if, if you think the paper is good enough, it, it's okay, then I'd say perhaps you know leave some of your other comments out. But it's a balance. It's a balance. I say you don't want something going through with it, you know, some major area of defect now that you've noticed it. Thank you so much. I think that qualifies, uh, uh, that uh, satisfies uh, Kedar's queries. Thank you so much, Kedar, for uh, raising all the pertinent points. In fact, he's been one of the most active peer reviewers, Helen, and uh, actively contributing to the, you know, up, uh, upcoming um, South Asia edition. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of questions. These are the last questions which I'm taking today. And uh, these are the questions from Abhishek Aradhya and Daksha Murthy. Uh, they both related to the collaborative type of studies, uh, Helen. And Abhishek says that we are currently working on quality improvement collaboration. And how many maximum authors are allowed? And should we mention uh, the rest of them as study group and mention their names also? Probably as he had asked me this personally also, but we'd like to hear it from you. What is your take on that? Suppose a large multi-center, you know, collaborative yeah. is there. Yeah. How do we give authorship to them? Um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's good to acknowledge people who have been involved. I, I mean, I think it's to think whether they, whether or not they've actually contributed as an author, because I think people should only be listed as an author if they have been involved in the writing. There is a point there are, you know, authors, you can have a list of people for acknowledgements, 
And I think a lot of, you know, where it's a very, very large group, I think you need to sort of think carefully about who's actually been in the authorship group and who should go into the acknowledgement group of people who've been involved in the project. Um, and I think, if, I mean, the important thing is to be clear with people as early as you can, um, rather than just at the point where, you know, the paper's sort of on its second revision and sort of going through to publication. You don't want to suddenly drop a load of authors, you know, people who've been authors at that point and shunt them into acknowledgement trust. That's a bit weird. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's unlike it's unlikely that 30 people have really had a significant part in writing up the work, but very likely that 30 people have been involved in a multi-centre project or, you know, 50 people. So I think there, you know, there is this other uh, group, which is people, all the people you want to acknowledge for their support in carrying out the work and only include those who have made a real contribution to actually writing the paper uh, as authors. I think that would also answer Raksha Murthy's uh, uh, question. She says, how should an authorship dispute be handled in a collaborative QI paper? So you very well mentioned that primarily the criteria for authorship, I think, are well defined as far as uh, the international uh, you know, recommendations. The country and the contributor statement, if I remember correctly, we are all writing the contributor statement. And the contributor statement per se will give you a sound idea that at least who are the people who would be going into the acknowledgement part and who would be the ones in the authorship. And a priori, I think, in the collaborative, uh, we should uh, uh, be very clear who are going to be the primary authors and who are going to be the acknowledgement people. Otherwise, uh, there would be disputes. And I'm sure the journal would not allow any change in the authorship uh, criteria once uh, or the names or edition or deletion once it has been submitted and it has gone for peer review. Am I right, Helen? Yeah, that does get that does get very complicated. It it can it can be done, but it has to sort of, it has to sort of go up up the ranks and decision making in BMJ. And yes, we really don't want to be sort of getting too involved in that. I have to say, yeah. So I think with this, we've had a very interactive session and a phenomenal uh, you know session with uh, Helen Chris. And I think it's been a privilege in the new year for the entire teams from India and South Asia to be a part of this. And like I just mentioned, being a working day, uh, we would be releasing the recording on the YouTube channel of Communities of Practice for benefit of the entire Southeast Asia countries. And uh, we are very happy to announce here that the third edition is still accepting uh, the articles for submission and peer review. When you are selecting the articles, uh, you are submitting the articles, please select the South Asia edition from the drop down menu. And like I mentioned, the first 15, uh, 16 articles in this issue will get a full APC waiver courtesy UNICEF India. And the rest of the articles will also be accommodated with the approval of the ed editor in chief at a discounted APC, which is applicable for the India and the NQCN teams. And that will be through uh, my office and with the approval of the EIC. And we thank uh, 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 the NQCN office, which is coordinating, especially Sonam Jan, uh, Komal, and Rahul, been coordinating the entire process. And the last team of peer reviewers over the last two and a half years who've been uh, through COVID pandemic, Helen, they've been really working very hard on their clinical duties and still devoting time to you know conduct not only QI studies, and also peer review other papers. So thank you so much. And with this, I say goodbye to all of you and look forward to a very exciting third edition. Please continue your submissions and spread the word. Thank you so much. Over to you, Helen, for any last words, if you would like to. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who's um, joined this morning and um, who will be watching this on the recording. Um, it's really great to have this opportunity to sort of clarify some of the issues around peer review and just to say thank you very much indeed for all your work. You know, we, we cannot do it without you. The peer reviewers are you know, very much at the heart of um, the journal production. So thank you very much. We very, very much appreciate all of your input. And it's a real privilege and pleasure to have this opportunity to, to look at it all in a bit more detail. So um, wishing you all well and looking forward to seeing more papers coming in and, and getting some great peer reviews coming in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. And uh, wishing Thanks. all of you a very, uh, very pleasant 
days ahead and let's continue the submission process and an excellent peer review process thank you so much thank you thank you thank you sir bye thank, thank you. you for the wonderful presentation